Morning, church. My name is Josh. I'm the lead pastor here. And today I'm so excited. We are wrapping up our summer in the Sermon on the Mount. Can we celebrate that, that we made it through the whole (laughs) Sermon on the Mount this summer? And uh, it's exciting. Fall is a really exciting time. And I just have this sense that God has amazing things planned uh, in the life of our church. Uh, God's not done yet, and uh, I'm excited to see the ways that God moves in the life of our church, in your life this fall. Uh, One of the things that's exciting about uh, fall is people come back to church. I don't know if you've, you've seen that the last few weeks, but uh, typically, you know, people have summer travel plans, and that's totally fine. No guilt, no shame. Uh, if we haven't seen you for a while, we'll just assume you're one of the people watching online. Uh, but, but it's exciting to see people uh, come back and hear about their trips. Anyone make it to the beach? Just, just curious. Anyone go to the beach this summer? Okay. Good for you. Uh, I, didn't do, I, I didn't do too much traveling this summer, uh, but the beach... The beach is one of my favorite places to go. Maybe it's because I grew up uh, in Fairbanks, Alaska, which is in smack dab in the middle of Alaska, right? Do you know Alaska is the largest state in the United States? A lot of people think it's Texas. It's like Alaska is way bigger than Texas is. And I lived smack dab in the middle. And so if you wanted to see the ocean, you had to travel hours and hours to get there. And even then, it was kind of a letdown. The Alaskan coastline is not really something that you just go jump right in unless you're into the polar bear plunge thing. Uh, and, uh, and it's similar, right, in Idaho, right? So, so people kind of gravitate towards road trips to the coast or flying somewhere to be on the beach. And uh, when I was 16 years old, I got to get in touch uh, with kind of the, the other side of my multicultural home. My dad is from the Midwest, America, and my mom is from Australia. And when we were 16, we moved back to Australia. And uh, Australia has beautiful beaches. I think they literally like take sand from Australian beaches and they ship it to places like Hawaii to like make pristine uh, beaches. I just want to show you a picture of uh, this spring. My family went uh, to Australia and that's a couple of my daughters. Uh, It's actually one of my daughters is having a great time. The other one looks like she just fell. Uh, But that's a beach called Nobby's Beach. Can you see way at the end there? Way at the end, it's a lighthouse at the end. And uh, it's a beautiful, like it's just miles, miles and miles of pristine, beautiful sand and waves and there's surfing competitions. Uh, That's Newcastle, Australia. That's where my uh, parents live. Here's the thing about the beach. The beach is nice until it's not until there's a storm. Fun fact about Newcastle, Australia. Newcastle, Australia is the largest coal exporter in the entire world. And in June of 2007, uh, there was this violent storm and it washed this ship onto shore. This is one of these giant coal ships. Uh, It's called the Pasha Bulker. June 8th, 2007, this ship washed up on the very same beach. That is the very same beach from the photos I just showed you, right? Little kids laughing and playing, having a good time. And uh, the reason I I know about this storm is because that is the exact week that my family moved to Australia when I was 16 years old. And uh, Australia had been in a drought for about seven years. And this storm, no joke, was the most violent storm in 50 years on the coast of Australia. Uh, 10,000 Newcastle properties were flooded, 5,000 cars were damaged, and the insurance claims exceeded $1 billion. This was intense. It went on for weeks. And these, these giant coal ships, uh, they're, they're out there. Like, if you go to the beach, you'll see them kind of like, they're little, they look like tiny toy boats, right? You'll see them on the horizon. And when it's time for them to come in, they, they go right past the lighthouse right past Nobby's Beach. There's the recreational side of the beach. And then you have on the other side, there's this narrow port that either the little tiny guide boats or the tugboat, they they, they bring them in. And this is one of the only times that this has happened. It took weeks and hundreds of thousands of dollars and helicopters to get the Pasha Bulker off of Nobby's Beach. And, uh, And I tell you that story, all this to say, The beach is the last place that you would want to be when a storm hits. When a storm hits, you run for shelter. You run 
for cover. And Jesus, as we wrap up the Sermon on the Mount, he's going to tell us a parable, a short story, and it's a short story about a storm that's going to hit. And I just want to ask you that question, because that language is familiar to us, isn't it? The storms that we face in life. I just want to ask you, what are the storms that you are facing in your life right now? Uh, I think about the last two years, our world seems like it's in a storm somehow, right? The entire world, you think about the pandemic and the war in Europe. Uh, Think about racial tensions, crazy politics, gun violence, and the list of problems seems like it goes on and on and on. And maybe for you, you have a difficult time paying attention to the problems out there because you've got so many problems right here close to home, internal struggles, mental health, loneliness, depression, suicidal thoughts. You've got marriage problems or single problems or parenting problems or difficulties at work or difficulties in your finances, right? The list goes on and on and on and on. These are are the storms that we face. And yet what storms have, uh, what happens when storms hit is they often shake our faith. They shake the foundation in which we live our life. And maybe for you, if, you, if you're coming to church today and your life is just peachy, okay? Everything is just smooth sailing. I hate to be a downer on you. I really do. Check the forecast. Storms come for us all. None of us are exempt. And what happens is these storms have a tendency to shake us to the very core of who we are, the things that we build our life on. I don't think it's a mistake that when the Apostle Paul is writing to his apprentice Timothy, who's leading a church in Ephesus in 1 Timothy 1.19, Paul is describing people who have lost their faith, and the terminology he uses is some have shipwrecked, what? Their faith. Think about that, that, that story of the Pasha Bulker, like hundreds of thousands of pounds. It's not supposed to be on this recreational beach, right? Where is it supposed to be? It's supposed to be in the port. It's supposed to be in this narrow channel. And I think back to last week, Jesus making the point that the way of Jesus is, it's not wide, what is it? It's narrow. And Jesus' words really function as this lighthouse. Go this way. Follow me, right, to teach us the the way in which we should live our lives. But the storm, what happens, you can imagine, can you imagine being the captain of the Pasha Bulker in 2007? And just the, the, the raging waves and the wind are blowing so violently that you can't even see the lighthouse anymore. And for some of us, we face things that have almost at times, or perhaps they have, shipwrecked our faith. So what's it going to take for you and I to develop a faith that stands the test of time? To develop a faith that has resilience. I had the opportunity to preach this same passage of scripture earlier this summer in LA to a group of over a thousand high school students. Here's a picture. Uh, I took this picture after uh, after I got done preaching during worship. And that, there's something powerful about that, right? Have you ever had an experience where you were just part of hundreds of people all crying out to God in worship? It was this powerful experience. And, and I preached pretty much the same message I'm going to preach to you today. But I shared with these students this heartbreaking, gut-wrenching statistic from Barna in, in 2019. That statistically speaking, if you, if you think about that picture, right? Hundreds of high school students two-thirds of those students will walk away from their faith over the next decade. And that's gotten worse, by the way, over the last 10 years. It was about 59% in 2011, and then 2019, Barna uh, did a new study on those statistics. And we're not sure how many, if any, of those students will ever come back to faith in Jesus, will ever come back to church. And I just was able to challenge, right, 1,000 high school students to say, don't be a statistic, Don't be a statistic. Storms will come for all of us. We've got to be able to develop a resilient faith that stands the test of anything that life has to throw at us. That's what Jesus' goal is at the end of the Sermon 
on the mount. Now, there's nothing wrong. I, I don't mean to slam that event or slam, you know, worship gatherings or powerful experience. Is there anything wrong with having a powerful experience with God? No, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a very good thing to do. However, I think so many people base their faith in Jesus off of one powerful experience they had years ago. And the hype, and that, we, what do we call them? We call them mountaintop experiences, don't we? Right? Going to a, a youth conference, maybe even being a part of a Sunday worship gathering. I'll tell you a mountaintop experience. Listening to Jesus preach the sermon on the, on the mountaintop. You don't get much more mountaintop experience than hearing the Son of God share divine wisdom, authoritative teaching, right? Everyone there. On, this, on the Sermon on the Mount. Everyone had this mountaintop experience, but not everyone followed Jesus. So there's nothing wrong with powerful experiences, but our faith cannot be based solely on emotions or feelings or powerful experience. Jesus is looking for lifelong followers, people to commit to following the way of Jesus. In another parable, uh, we'll get to our text in just a moment, I promise. Uh, in another parable that Jesus told, he, he spoke about this in Matthew chapter 13. Do you remember the parable of the sower and the seeds? The farmer goes out and he's scattering seeds and there's four different kinds of soil. One of the soil that I think accurately represents this tendency uh, is the, the rocky soil. In Matthew 13, 5 through 6, Jesus says this, other seeds fell on the rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, but since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no what? Since they had no root, they withered away. We need more than, than an exciting experience with God to sustain our faith through the storms of life. We need depth, we need roots. And we need to dig our lives deep into a foundation that lasts. And so wherever you're at, maybe you're here and you're just checking out church, you would describe yourself as a person who doesn't have a faith in Jesus yet. Or maybe you're here and you've been following Jesus for decades or you're anywhere in between. I pray that today you would go deeper. Do you realize that? That we can always go deeper in our faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, is going to call us to a deep, resilient faith in him. If you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus says this, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Just to point out, this, this verse, Matthew 7, 27, is like the final line that Jesus would have preached in the Sermon on the Mount. And it ends with someone dying in a storm. According to like, you know, like modern metrics, you'd be like, that's not a great way to end a sermon. It's like, and the house fell on him and he died. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs> this, is in, this is insane. That's the final, the final verse. He doesn't even switch the order and have the house crashing first. And then, but there's a good guy who his house. Jesus ends. And we've got to understand what he's doing. He's trying to teach us the importance of living out our faith in him. Now, there's, we're, we're mixing metaphors a little bit today, right? Matthew 13, the shallow soil, it needs roots. The rocks are good or bad in that one. In Matthew chapter 13, the rocks are, they're bad. They're preventing the roots from going in. And uh, I know a little bit about gardening. Rocks are bad if you're gardening, okay? But if you're building, rocks are good. Okay, you see the mixed metaphor? So we're going to talk about, about, about roots. We're also going to talk about foundations today. And this, this idea is often mixed in Scripture, but essentially it's the same exact idea, having a deep relationship with Christ. So here's our point for today. Stay rooted in the rock. Okay? 
We want to stay rooted in the rock. Not, we're not talking about rocks being like those things that prevent our faith from being shallow. What we're talking about is we're talking about building your life on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And, and the rock doesn't make great soil if you're gardening, but it makes a perfect, firm foundation. And Jesus contrasts a firm foundation, a rock, with the sand. Here we have some sand. This is actually uh, a little jar that we keep in our house. This is our wedding sand. You want to do like a unity candle? We did unity sand, okay? So some of the sand comes from Kenai, Alaska, which is where my wife is from. And some of the other sand comes from Newcastle, Australia. And they've, over time, the original thing that we put it in, it actually broke and we swept it up and we put it in a new jar. And anyways, that's how marriage goes though, isn't it, right? <laughs> um, so it's all, it used to be in like layers, but now it's just kind of mixed. But that's all, that's a, this is gonna be a good uh, sermon illustration when we, I preach on marriage one day. I'll bring the sand back. And remind you of that. Here, here's, the th- here's the thing about sand. Here's the thing about sand. Imagine, imagine the guy who builds his house on the sand. It would have, his, the structure that he built would have gone up way faster. Correct? Because, I mean, imagine, like, I, I've done some fencing. I haven't done, like, a, a ton of proper construction myself. Uh, but I, I've built uh, a lot of fences, actually. And uh, you know when you're digging through soil and it's difficult and it's hard work and you get the, have to get the jackhammer out or one of those giant bars out, right, when it's rocky versus you're digging a hole and it's just like easy. Like it's easier, isn't it? I think that's significant. The wide path that Jesus has already taught us about, Jesus himself describes it as easy. It's easier, Right? It's not narrow. It's you know, kind of anything goes. And so to build your life on the sand, I think it's Jesus is teaching us that's an easier way of life. But also the problem with sand is sand, I don't know if you can see, it's always shifting, isn't it? It's always moving. It's not stable. Here's the point. Shifting sands fall flat. Shifting sands. If you build your life on a foundation that's unstable or always changing, it falls flat. I just want to give you some examples of different foundations for your life that often shift. Popularity is one. You might be popular one moment and cancel the next. Social media is a shifting sand. The trends on social media, the amount of followers or likes that you get, even the algorithm is always changing. Entertainment is a shifting foundation. Uh, Grades, if you're still in school, or success in your business. Uh, I think about good looks, right? Fashion trends, even your own personal health, having lots of stuff, having a large bank account. That's great until there's a recession, or that's great until you lose your job. Relationships even are shifting sands. You know, that relationship's great until it's not, until there's a fight, until there's a divorce, until your kids won't return your phone calls. Do you see this? These are all, and and the list goes on and on, but there's so many different foundations that we try to build our lives on, and those foundations, not that there's necessarily anything even wrong with those things. They're just, they can't hold the weight of your life and your identity. They will change. They will let you down. They're false foundations. And I would just challenge you to examine the foundation of your life and legitimately ask yourself, what's the thing that I think about the most in life? What's the thing that I get most excited about? What's the framework I'm living my life? What is truly my identity in? That's your foundation, right? Is is where you get your, your sense of identity, your sense of value. It's the thing that you live for. In Alaska, uh, where I grew up, there's this, there's this phenomenon called permafrost. Have you heard of this before? Have you seen this? So it's, it's very deceptive because in Alaska, again, like where I live, there's not like there was sandy foundations, but people would build their house, and if they didn't get the, the ground under their house checked, and you would have to check like dozens of feet down. Okay, not just like the first couple feet. You'd have to check like a really long way down. There's people whose whole jobs is to go out, drill down, and check the soil before you build your house because what permafrost is, is high levels of moisture in the ground. So much so, it's 
perma permanently frozen until maybe there's a hot summer and then it melts. Or maybe there's an extra cold winter and it expands. You know how ice does that, right? Ice expands and the water it contracts, all that biology and all that sort of stuff, right? And what would happen is you would have a structure and maybe for like a few years, no problems. And then there would be like one really hot summer or something. And all of a sudden, half of your house is sinking underground. Or, or, there would be, or, or it would expand and it would start breaking things. And you can look this up later if you want, per, like permafrost, you know, just Google, Google image search it. You can see, and we would drive by houses. Like I've seen these houses firsthand. Because they thought the foundation, the ground that they were building their house on, their life on, was stable. But there was something underneath the surface that was shifting. And, and I'm just here to say this. That relationship might not have let you down yet. Living for success, living for wealth, living for, you know, climbing that ladder, that might not have let you down yet, but it is not a firm foundation. And shifting sands inevitably will fall flat. Jesus contrasts the shifting sands with a person who builds himself, builds their life on the rock. Okay, do you know the story of the three little pigs? My daughters love this story, okay? If you never heard the story, allow me to illuminate you. So there's three pigs, you got a big bad wolf, and each of the three pigs build little houses to protect themselves from the wolf. And the first one builds it out of straw, which obviously that's a bad idea, right? We know that. And uh, the wolf says, little pig, little pig, let me in. And the pig says, not by the hair of my chin, chin, chin. And uh, the big bad wolf huffs and he puffs and he blows the house down. And so that little pig goes squealing to the next, to, to his buddy. Are they siblings? Are they buddies? I don't know. There's three pigs. It doesn't matter. To his buddy and uh, that one builds his house out of wood, but it's like sticks, not like a strong like timber frame. It's like just piles a bunch of sticks. Anyways, same deal. Let me in. Not by here, my chin, chin, chin. Huffs, puffs, blows the house down. And then the third pig builds his house out of bricks. And uh, the wolf comes up, and he huffs and he puffs, and nothing happens. And the moral of the story is it's always important to check your structural engineering before you build a house. That's the point of that. That's the moral of the story. And uh, so to contrast the sand, what I want to share is, it, is really this brick. Guess where this brick is from? Here. It's from this church building right here. And I know it might be a bad omen that I'm it's like, are the bricks falling out? No. We did open up. We've done this massive renovation. And we've actually only busted down like one hole in the wall. It's the entrance to the men's restroom. Uh, because the other entrance, you'd have to walk like into the children's ministry area and go around. And we just thought that would be a little bit weird. So... We opened up, uh, so I think that's where this brick actually comes from. And uh, to contrast that idea of s shifting sands, I want to just paint this picture of a, a brick house or a brick building like this church building. Uh, the cornerstone for this church building was laid in 1910, and the building was dedicated November 26, 1911. That means this November, this completed structure will be 111 years old, which is amazing when you think about all of the weather in Boise over the last century. This building was built a few years before the Ararat Dam was built, which at the time was the largest concrete arch dam in the entire world. Do you realize this? I did a little bit of uh, arch dam research in preparation for today, 1915, and because the Boise River is prone to flooding. So before the city of Boise had a plan for controlling floods, the congregation here said, we're going to go ahead and build this building, right? Hell or high water, whether flood, you know, no matter what comes. And it, would, it withstood floods. It withstood, there's a, a, the largest earthquake in recent years was 1983, the Chalice earthquake. It was a 7.3 on a Richter scale. And guess what building is still standing? This church building right here. Uh, 2017, anyone remember Snowmageddon? I was actually here for that, Snowmageddon, and just like so much snowfall on the roads, and uh, we did some structural repairs in our renovation on, in the rafters. I am amazed that the, the, <laughs> that the ceiling is still standing, because there was, there was some need of structural repairs. Not to mention, in 1986, in this building, there was a building fire. 
And there's still areas of the building where you can see like scorch marks. Not to mention all of the just normal wind and rain and hail and weather of the building. This, this building's old, but she's steady, okay? It, this building is steady. It was built right. There's no permafrost, there's no sand under the foundation. Here's the point. While shifting sands fall flat, a firm foundation stays strong. A firm foundation stays strong. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus, it's a parallel account of this parable. And this is what Jesus says. He describes the wise man a little bit differently in Luke 6. In Matthew chapter 7, it sounds like the person just finds a rock. Like, this, oh, this is a good rock. This is a good location for me to build my life. And that is important. But look at how it's, the wise man is described in Luke 6, 48. He, the wise man, is like a man building a house who dug what? Deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And I think this is really helpful for us. This isn't some passive, I wonder which location is going to be the right location for me to build my life. But there's actually this idea of digging deep enough to you hit bedrock, doing the structural engineering, checking if there's permafrost there, right? Does that make sense? And there's effort involved in growing a resilient faith. Sanctification is not a passive process. And here at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is inviting us to participate in following him, not merely to have a great mountaintop experience with him. Here are three ways, okay? I want to end or wrap up the Sermon on the Mount with three ways, three steps you can take to go deeper in your faith than ever before. Number one, trust God's love. Everyone say trust. trust. We're going to trust God's love. One of the first things, one of the first cracks that begins to form in, in someone's faith, in the foundation of their life, when a storm hits, when a trial hits, is I'm not so sure God really cares about me. Have you experienced that before? Right? I had a strong faith when I was on the beach and it was nice and sunny and everything was calm, but this storm is hitting me and I'm not so sure God loves me. I'm not so sure God cares about me. And in times like this, what it means to be deeply rooted in your faith is it means you trust that God still loves you even if your external circumstances are telling you the opposite. Look at what Paul writes in Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. Pay attention to the language. Uh, he's praying for the church. He prays that you, being rooted and grounded. You see the mixed metaphor there? Deep roots, firm foundation. You see that? Being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. How much does God love you? It's four-dimensional. It surpasses all knowledge. It's something you're never going to be able to fully wrap your mind around. God loves you. He created you. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He created the universe so that you could be an object of his love. God loves you. He gives you every single breath, even before you know him. Even, even if you're rebelling against God, even when you hate God, God is still sustaining your life. How much does God love you? He sent his one and only son to the cross to die in your place, to be raised back to life so that you might have a, a, a hope of eternity, a hope of forgiveness, a hope of mercy, and be reconciled, and be made right with God. That's how much God loves you. He loves you to death, even death on a cross. And you have to be reminded of those gospel truths when a storm hits you. If you're, going to, if you're going to have a firm foundation built on this cornerstone of Christ Jesus, you've got to be reminded of gospel truths that God still loves you. See, God's love does not spare us from every storm, but God's love means he walks with us through every storm. Psalm 23, why do we fear no evil? Because he's with us in the valley of the shadow of death. Not because he never allows us to go into the valley of the shadow of death. We, we fear no evil because he's with us. It's God's presence that gives us peace. And, uh, and I just, I just want to encourage you today. God loves you so much. 
Would you trust that? Not just, not just would you like, oh, I know God, Jesus loves me this, I know for the Bible it told me so. This is not some basic Sunday school truth. We have to be teaching it to our children, but this is something that you never grow out of. Trusting and recognizing and building and digging deep. Why do we take the Lord's Supper every week? To remind us of the gospel. To remind us that the cross, that's how much Jesus loves you. He loves you so much. Do you trust that? Do you believe it? Are you building your life on that? No matter what storm comes, you can trust that God still loves you. We've been using this, this imagery of storms to describe the storms, the trials and the suffering that we face in our life, correct? And that's certainly, I think, an accurate interpretation. But one of maybe, one of, one of the interpretations of this idea of the storm that Jesus might be primarily referencing is it's a common way of referring to judgment day. Do you realize that? A coming storm is judgment day. And if you read the other, like the leading up, if you look at last week, Jesus, I mean, it seems like when he's contrasting the way of the world and the way of Jesus, seems like he's talking about two destinations, right? Two paths that lead us to two destinations. Uh, I think Jesus might primarily have in mind the storm of final judgment that, w- that even if, you are successful and you're wealthy and you can afford to always live a life of comfort, right, and luxury and you can avoid kind of any kind of major or serious problem in your life. What would it gain you to, 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 if you got the whole world in comfort but you were not able to stand before Jesus Christ in final judgment? Does that make sense? There's a storm coming for every single human being who's ever lived on planet Earth. Jesus is coming back. But the good news of the gospel is that you can have confidence on the day of judgment. You can have confidence when you're standing before Jesus Christ. And I just want to invite you, if you've never said yes to Jesus being the foundation to building your life on the foundation of Jesus Christ, with Christ as your Savior and Lord, today can be the day that you say yes to Jesus. And I would invite you to respond in baptism. Baptism is the way Jesus instructed us to say yes to him. There's going to be many ways that you declare your faith to Jesus, but there's one baptism. There's one kind of starting line that Jesus instructs us to say yes to him. And we've got baptisms next Sunday in the Boise River. We're going we're gonna to baptize, you know, Lord willing, many more people o- over the years. So I'm not trying to say that this is your only chance, but it's probably the last Boise River baptisms before it starts getting cold that we're going to do. And uh, I would just invite you, if you've never received the gospel, I mean, how do you know that Jesus is worth entrusting your life to? I mean, you can trust Jesus as Lord and Savior because you trust God's love. Because you trust, like, why did Jesus do that? Because he first loved us. The gospel is this beautiful love story. And so you can follow him with everything because he first loved you. If you want more information, you want to sign up, you can go online to hillcityboise.org slash baptism. That's step one. We're going to trust God's love. Number two, if you're taking notes, listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Everyone say, Listen. You got to say it like you really mean it. Listen, like you're talking to your children. Listen, we've got to listen to Jesus. Jesus begins the parable of the wise and the foolish builders by saying, he who hears these words of mine, okay? Remember, final passage from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is saying, all right, you've all heard the sermon now. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to continue to listen to these words? And the reality is, part of building a firm foundation is not only receiving God's love through the gospel, but it's listening to Jesus. It's listening to God's word. Jesus says in John 10 that his sheep hear his voice. Are you able to discern the voice of Jesus in the midst of all the other noises going on in the world, all the other chatter going on, all the social media and all the news and all the opinions and all the perspectives, can you hear through all of that the voice of Jesus Christ? We've got to listen to Jesus. 
I love how uh, it's put in Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is another one of those contrasts, right? The way of the world, a person who, who walks with the wicked and the sinners and the scoffers versus someone who delights in the law of the Lord, who's, who's meditating on God's word day and night. Look at how that person is described. Psalm 1, 2, and 3 it says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. It's this picture of a tree that's got these deep roots. And we're, what is helping those roots grow deeper? It's God's word. It's God's word. It's feasting on God's word multiple times a day. I mean, how healthy would a person be who only has one meal on a Sunday morning? I mean, Jesus taught us man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. I would just say, how, how consistent is your diet when it comes to Bible engagement? Do you have a consistent plan for reading God's word, for knowing it, for discerning the, the voice of Christ? Look at how Paul says it in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's not enough for us to just abide in, in Jesus as a person. We've got to abide in his words and allow his words to abide in us. Let me just ask you. Does the word of Christ, or maybe we could say the teachings of Christ, the words of Christ, does that dwell richly in you or scarcely in you or occasionally in you? Or maybe I'll listen to the podcast or maybe I'll, I'll hear God's word on a Sunday morning. Right? I've, I've referenced a study from the Center for Bible Engagement that they did this massive study with thousands of people across all different ages and they found that there was negligible effect to someone who reads the Bible three times or less per week. Now, if you read the Bible three times or less per week, I'm not here to tell you it would be better if you read it zero times, okay? But what they found is they found that there was this, there, there was this kind of turning point for people who read four times or more per week, that all of a sudden, somehow they were activating God's word and it was, it was bearing fruit in their life and it was making a difference and they had all of these, you know, all these awesome life change and mental health was higher and they were like 200 and something percent more likely to share their faith and be active in preaching the gospel to their friends. And I'm not here to say that there's anything magic about the number four, other than the fact that four out of seven is a majority. Do you see that? Four out of seven days in a week is most of the time. Do you read the Bible most of the time? Do you read the Bible most of the time? Are you engaged? Are you memorizing? Are you meditating? And some people get discouraged because they tried a Bible reading plan and they got like 15 days behind. They tried to catch up and read for like eight hours one day and that's just not gonna work, right? Even if it's a few verses and maybe you need to switch your approach or your method for Bible reading. For some people, man, it is large sections of scripture and they're plowing through Bible reading plans and that's amazing if that works for you. If for you, it needs to slow down and meditate on just a few verses. Find what works for you. And I just ask you, when are you reading the Bible this fall and what are you reading in the Bible this fall? If you've never read the gospel, start in the book of Matthew and just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, for us as a church, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna ignore or neglect the Sermon on the Mount just because we spent a whole summer in it. I'll probably preach many more sermons going back to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is saying, don't forget my words. Now, it's not just enough to have heard. I've heard that before, but are you listening, actively listening to Jesus? So we're gonna trust God's love. We're gonna listen to Jesus. Here's number three. Live it out. We're gonna live it out. Everyone say live. We're gonna live it out. Here's what's shocking about the parable of the wise and the foolish builders. Both of them heard the instructions. Did you catch that? Both the wise and the foolish builder heard you shouldn't build your house on the sand because a storm is going to come. Both of them heard it. So modern application, we would say both of these builders could be found in a church building on Sunday morning. Both of these builders maybe even grew up in church or went to youth group or had powerful mountaintop experiences. But one of them chose, willingly chose to ignore the instructions from the master builder, to ignore the instructions from the one who actually knows what's, what's right, the righteous way, the, the way of Jesus. And one of them followed. Do you see that? 
right? We looked at the, the, the contrast between two different followers. Some followers say, Lord, Lord. Others live, Lord, Lord. Here, the, the difference is both people hear Jesus, but only one follows Jesus. This is the difference between obedience and disobedience. And, uh, and, and Paul really gets at the same thing in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. He says this, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord. So people have received Christ Jesus as Lord. Paul says, So walk in him, rooted and built up, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in in Thanksgiving. You see those two words again? Rooted and built up. We want to be rooted in the rock. You want to go deeper in your faith than ever before. What does this mean? It means that there are still sins in your life that you need the Holy Spirit to sanctify you from. That God wants not just to forgive you for your sins, but to free you from the power of sin. And so there are things in your life that Jesus says no, and you need to start saying no to those things as well. Does that make sense? Not just to receive Jesus as Lord, but to walk in in the way of Jesus. And so you're going you're gonna to confess, you're going to repent, you're going to invite the Holy Spirit to sanctify you. There are good things. It's not just that Christianity is a list of bad things, rules that you need to follow. There's also good things, good works that Christ is calling you to say yes to. And there are going to be things that are going to take courage and boldness. There are going to be things that are going to be scary. But there are, there are good works which you were literally created in Christ Jesus, he prepared these works in advance so that you would walk in them. Do you realize that? And every day that you live a complacent faith, where you're doing nothing and you're satisfied with being a churchgoer, is a day that you're not obeying the way of Jesus. You're not walking by the Spirit. You're not following Jesus. And we have to take Jesus' words seriously when he says, it's not just enough to know the right thing that you should do. You've got to do it. You've got to follow him. If you, want to, if you want to legitimately build your life on the foundation of Jesus Christ, you have to live out your faith. You've got to live out your faith. And then uh, here's a little epilogue for the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 7, 28 through 29, this is kind of concluding Matthew chapter 7. When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished. I just, I like, imagine you're there for a moment. If it helps to close your eyes, imagine that you were there. You literally heard the Son of God preach the most amazing sermon. They were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as one of their scribes. And so Jesus gets done with the sermon, you know, class dismissed, see you next week, right? He, and he's, there, people are walking down, and everyone had a mountaintop experience. Everyone appreciated Jesus is teaching, but not everyone followed Jesus. And for us as a church, I hope that we would not be satisfied going through the Sermon on the Mount with a bunch of insightful takeaways, interesting ideas, but Jesus is calling us to follow him with everything. So what are we going to do? We're going to trust in God's love, we're going to listen to Jesus, and we're going to live it out, and that's how we stay rooted in the rock. Let's stand and worship. And so we're going to introduce a, a new song that's based on the beloved hymn, Firm Foundation. And as we do this, let's continue to reflect on those three points. Maybe you're here and you do need to just receive God's love. Maybe you've been following Christ, but you've kind of held his love at a distance. And you have had maybe a hard heart. Maybe you've feel, feeling like God's abandoned you. And so as we sing this, would you endeavor, would you just say, Christ, I receive your love. Maybe you need to be listening more. And so as we sing this, would you let the Holy Spirit convict you and maybe even give you some practical things like, man, okay, I need to read my Bible at this time every day. But for all of us, let's continue to let Christ be our firm foundation. Let's continue to Make it our prayer that each and every day we would base our life upon him. So let's sing this out. Oh, Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, 
Oh, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. Thank you, Lord. So why would he fail now? Oh, he won't. Oh, oh he won't. I've still got joy. And I've still got joy in chaos. And I've got peace that makes no sense. And I won't be going under. He won't, oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, he won't, he'll never fail us. Oh, he won't fail. He won't fail. Oh, he won't, oh, he won't, he'll never fail, he'll never fail. He won't fail. build our foundation on his love together, his immense love. Rain came and wind blew. Christ is my friend. 
God today. No, He won't. He'll never fail. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. So God, we declare that out in this place, that you will never fail us. And God, when our doubts come, would you remind us would you remind us of your love? Would you remind us of those spiritual disciplines that can keep us grounded? Would you remind us of the promises in your word? And God, may we run down the paths that you have for us, the good works that you've already prepared for us, knowing that our firm foundation is in you, our hope is in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for declaring that out with us. We're going to hear from one of our missionaries, Steve. But before we do that, let's look up at the screens for a short video. You can have a seat. Good morning. I'm Steve Bragg. This is my wife, uh, Juliana. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we're missionaries to the Philippines. Uh, we just spent eight years there planting churches. And we're currently on furlough, hoping to go back this next year. Uh, we currently have 35 churches in the Philippines. We're church planters. We plant in the remote, isolated villages uh, where the gospel is most needed. And so that's where all of our churches are. We uh, average about 70 baptisms a year. Uh, this year, right now, with the 35 churches, we're averaging about 1,000 people each Sunday worshiping the Lord. So, and we've had about 900 baptisms in all with the, with the whole time that we've been there. So it all started with $100 in a prayer. Someone gave me $100 back in 2005 and said, uh, use this for the kingdom. I thought, wow, what, what do I do with this $100? I really, I started praying, Lord, what, we, what do you want me to do with this $100? And I carried it in my pocket so I'd be ready to use it when he told me to use it. And one night my wife was talking to her sister and they needed a church in their little community. There was no place to worship. And I asked her, well, how much is $100 in the Philippines? And it was 5,000 pesos. 
And so I got excited about building a little church there, and other people got excited with me. And in 2006, we went back for the dedication. Since then, we've built another 34 churches and growing. We average about three churches a year uh, that we plant uh, new, and uh, we're constantly needing leaders for these churches. And the Lord is wonderful about bringing leaders, people that are just, they've been called by God, uh, they, they, they know they've been called by God, they're excited about God, and they want to serve God, and God brings them to us, but they need training. Uh, they need to learn the Word of God, they need to get grounded in their faith, uh, and, and they need all the tools to be able to serve God with. One of the ways we do that is through conventions and youth camps. And that's what we've invited Josh uh, and Andrew and whoever else comes that you would like to come, we, we would like you to come and help us. In the conventions, we use those to teach and to inspire. Uh, uh, and we've had, uh, we've had Derek Voorhees from the college, Danny has come uh, one week, Danny Herod, and, uh, and now we've got Josh coming to inspire. And so, I'm excited about you helping to support us in this, in this growth, in this movement, and in what God has given us to do. It's truly a God thing, and I'm excited to be a part, a part of it. And I'm excited for you to be a part of it. I, I want to share just one more little thing. I received my call to, to be a pastor right here. I won't tell you how many years ago, but I was in Bible college, and there was a pulpit here, and I was... I was, I was polishing it, and I said, Lord, I don't know if I can preach. And then he said, just as plain as day in my heart, there are people that need to hear the word of God. Well, about a year later, uh, one of the professors asked me to preach for my first time. There was a church that needed, needed someone to come preach. It was this church. Yeah. So I received my call, preached my first sermon here, and I'm glad to be here Thank you so much for your love for the Filipino people. Thank you so much for your support. And um, please, we covet your prayers, most of all. So we're, we're excited. Um, we're excited to be, I'm excited to go and see the work and learn and encourage uh, specifically youth and young adults in the Philippines this October. Uh, if you want to chat more with Steve or Juliana, there's a, a table in the lobby that has uh, some paper, some pamphlets, some information, but they'll also be over there in between services. would encourage you to connect with them, even to encourage them and tell them uh, that you appreciate the work that they're doing. Uh, if you'd like to specifically donate to help support uh, the trip to the Philippines, there is a fund online. You can, you can actually, there's a drop-down menu if you give online, uh, or you can always write that on in a memo of a check or an envelope, that sort of thing. Uh, we do have the opportunity uh, to continue in worship through giving. The ushers will have uh, the, the baskets at the doors today. Uh, we give because God gave. It's one of the ways that we continue to, to serve God is through offering our finances towards the work of ministry. And uh, a few things before we send you out today. Uh, first one, very, very important that you know we are not meeting in this building next Sunday. We will be at the park, okay? Church in the Park is next Sunday. We'll be at Esther Simplot Park uh, at 10 a.m., one service, one service, not two services, one. We'll do outdoor worship. Uh, a shorter message, and then we'll do baptisms at the park. So I would encourage you, if you need more details, uh, the event is online. You can invite your friends. It's a great opportunity to invite someone, especially if they're intimidated by kind of like churchy things like stained glass windows or, you know, sitting in a pew, if, they're, if that's kind of weird. Uh, have them bring their lawn chair, right? It's, it's just a field. There's not like seating, so bring a lawn chair, bring a picnic blanket, uh, if you want to have uh, someplace to sit at the park. And I would, just, I would just encourage you, one of the beautiful things about a baptism is it, it, it not only joins us to Christ, it jo like to hear 900 baptisms in the Philippines through their work, it actually joins you to the family of God as well. It's one of the ways that we not only identify with Christ, but we're identified now as part of God's family internationally around the globe. 
And uh, so even if you're someone who maybe you've, you've been following Jesus even for years, but you somehow missed that step uh, when you first came to Christ, no one encouraged you to get baptized, I would encourage you now. I uh, encourage you to follow Jesus Christ into ba- baptism, and uh, you can sign up online as well, and we would love to just celebrate. Uh, even it, Not that it undoes any of the time that you follow Jesus before now, but to be obedient to Christ and to get baptized at Church in the Park. You can sign up online. Today's our last park day, the last day that we'll be at Memorial Park, 1230 till 2 uh, there. And then I would once again just invite you, if you want prayer for anything, if there's a praise, if you want to give your life to Christ, or even if there's just something that is a concern to you, our members of our prayer team would be down here near the stage, down front, and they would love to just lay a hand on you if you're comfortable and pray for you, and you can uh, receive prayer with that. Let's stand for our closing benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace.